welcome, welcome. I'm so very glad you're here, whether you're joining us in person or online. My name is Seth, and this is The Foundry, where we're all about a better you and a better world. What do you think of this setup? It's interesting, right? Yeah, it should be pretty cool. I think Tony, if you, if you don't know anything about Tony, it seems like he's going to be a good guy, going to be a good time. So we'll have this set up and have some fun if you're going to be here. So I look forward to that this evening. Um, so last week, we began our Lent slash Easter slash and beyond series that we're calling Sacred Space. And Joe did a great job of getting us started. So big shout out to Joe. Thank you to him. <clears throat> as he apparently was doing everything at the church that day because we were not here, but I'm, I'm grateful to him. Uh, so he introduced this series with the idea of the beauty and the vastness uh, of the universe and the beauty and the vastness of Christ. And he talked about how Jesus, the Christ, is the light of the world. Now, uh, what we're attempting to do in this series is we're essentially trying to help us to expand our thoughts and understandings of the Christ, okay? Because sometimes what it seems like is when people talk about the Christ, what we're really talking about is just Jesus, right? Like the historical Jesus, he was here, he did this thing, that's what we're talking about. But the Christ is not like a last name. The Christ is a title. So when we say Jesus the Christ, we're talking about the one who ocup occupied this role at that particular time. So the truth is, I think, um, unfortunately and somewhat unintentionally, the church and many Christians, we've limited our understanding of the Christ. We, we've taken this great big concept and idea and we've shrunk it down to just the historical life of Jesus. And in doing so, I think we've painted ourselves into a bit of a corner. Corner. Okay, so that's the goal is to try to expand our understanding of, of the Christ. So I, I think maybe one way to think of it would be like to take this, for example. Like let's say we took this five-gallon bucket and we, we took a little trip to the beach. And we were really excited because it was a beautiful day and it wasn't cold anymore and the water was like 75, 80 degrees and it, we loved it. We had a good time. And then let's say we scooped up the bucket scooped up some of the ocean in the bucket and we were really excited about that and then we took this bucket full of ocean and then we brought it back to our homes and we set it up and then we began to like write songs and sing songs about how much we love the ocean and then then like we started to like worship the ocean and then we started to like invite people to come and experience the ocean this is cool, this is fine. There's a lot that we can learn or experience about the ocean that we've collected in this bucket. I can feel the saltiness. I can smell whatever the ocean smells like. Sometimes it's not so great. Like I can get a particular, a certain level of experience of the ocean that I've scooped up here, but this does not contain the vastness of the ocean, does it? I don't feel the waves, the power of the waves here. I don't feel the pull of the currents. I don't, I, 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 like, th this is not an expanse that my eyes cannot fully take in. Limiting the ocean to the bucket, I, I don't experience the insane amount of life that is found within the ocean. So while this gives me a sense of the ocean, this isn't the fullness of it. And, and the thing is, is like, I like this to some degree because it's comfortable. I can understand this. I can, I can describe this. I can wrap my brains around this. Oh, it's this shape, it's this size, it has, there's this much volume to it. I can wrap my brain around that. We like things that we can quantify, but this is not the fullness of the ocean. You see, when it comes to this idea, this concept of Jesus the Christ, Jesus is this like personification of this much bigger thing. So while that may give me a sense of the ocean, it's just kind of an introduction. Now this may be like a big thought for some of us, kind of a switch in, in our thinking, but I believe that this actu idea actually serves to bring more meaning and more beauty and more depth into the entirety of our existence. Think about all of the love and the gratitude that you may have towards Jesus, what he taught, what he did, what he offered. 
And then consider that when we understand Jesus, <clears throat> that Jesus was just an expression of the Christ and not the vastness of the Christ, it should be a bit overwhelming, I, I think. We should be overwhelmed at the thought about what it means for how we think of God, for about what it means for, for how we view the world, about what it means for how we understand the self. So Jesus is referred to as Jesus Christ in many places and out throughout the scripture, but then there's many places as well where the authors of the Bible make the clear distinction between Jesus and the Christ, which kind of supports what we're talking about here, okay? So let me show you a few examples. Mark chapter, or Matthew chapter 16. Now when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He said to them, but who do you yourselves say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, here's another one. Look at this in Luke chapter 2. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see the death, he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law. So Simeon is given this promise that you will see the Lord's Christ, and then here comes the child Jesus. Next verse. Luke chapter 4, demons were also coming out of many, shouting, you are the son of God. And yet he was rebuking them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. One more. Uh, this comes from Paul, uh, or Paul and Saul, uh, after the Damascus conversion stuff. Saul began to preach and teach. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So again, they're making this distinction between the humanity of Jesus or between the historical flesh and blood of Jesus and this expansive nature of the Christ. So Jesus is this tangible, like a temporary expression of the Christ who pervades all things. Okay, the, the scripture talks about this. Joe used these last week uh, this passage last week, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing <clears throat> was made that had been made. So the Christ was before creation. And all that is has come through the Christ. Colossians expands upon this idea, Colossians chapter 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. This sounds a bit like what Joe talked of last week about the laminin. Do you remember this? The glycoproteins that like hold the body together. Right? Like the Christ is this laminin of the universe. It's all being held together through Christ. So again, in him, that is the Christ, all things were created. In him, that is the Christ, all things hold together. Now, uh, Franciscan, uh, Franciscan philosopher and theologian John Dunn Scotus in the late 1200s, he taught that Christ was the quote-unquote first idea in the mind of God. I, I love this idea, this concept, that Christ was the first idea in the mind of God. The idea being that you have this divine spirit being that is God that wants to manifest God's self externally. And the reason God wants to manifest God's self externally is for the sake of relationship, 
because God is love. So the manifestation of the divine is about starting this like eternal love affair between matter that is creation and the God who is spirit. This is what we would actually call the Christ. And so Jesus becomes a personification of this first idea. So Christ is this eternal amalgam of matter and spirit, which is to say that all things have come through Christ and all things are held together in Christ. There's nowhere that Christ does not exist, which is to say that although we've often been taught to think of our lives in, the wor in our world in like these dualistic terms, right? We have the material realm, that's one thing, and then we have the spiritual realm, that's the other thing, and we kind of keep those separate and apart from one another. What we see here is when we lean into this understanding of the Christ, there is no real separation between the two, which is to say that it's all holy, it's all divine, it's all sacred, it's all sacred space from the very deepest depths of the universe to the very inmost pieces of ourselves. It's all sacred. Paul writes this in, in Colossians. Do not <clears throat> lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Paul says there is only Christ. He is everything. He is in everything. This is not like a pantheistic view of the universe. We are not saying that everything is God. We're not saying that everything is a God. This is actually what you might call panentheism, which means God is in all things, which is what it seems like the scripture is trying to get us to see and understand. And when we see and understand this, this is like, it's like everything we are, everything we do, everything that we experience this whole thing about living the life we have been given actually takes on much more meaning. Everything takes on much more value. Everything is now elevated with a much, much higher level of significance. Like for example, this dirt here. I got a whole bowl of lovely dirt. Now, we don't often give a lot of thought to dirt, do we? Unless you're planting a lot, it's maybe plant you think about dirt, but most of us, it's just dirt, who cares? We walk on it, we trample it, we drive on it, we build things on it, we try to get it off our hands in a sermon because it's messy, do you know? Like we don't, we don't often think a whole lot about the dirt. But when you begin to understand and, and live like your life through the lens of Christ is in all, Christ is all, Christ is the amalgam of matter and spirit, then all of a sudden this dirt is infused with all sorts of meaning and significance. This becomes a sacred space. And we're not going to worship the dirt. We're not going to believe that this dirt is godlike, obviously. But there is something sacred and holy about it. If these things are fused together, if the Christ is merged into these things, then there's something sacred about this, which means then, of course, how we treat the dirt, how we interact with creation becomes much more significant, which also is, as a bit of a side note here, it makes me think about how if we maintain the idea that one day God is coming back and he's going to rescue some and then he's going to destroy everything else and then everyone's going to float out there somewhere, like, it kind of seems like that concept doesn't really align with what the Bible is teaching, does it? If Christ is all, and if Christ is in all, then by suggesting God's going to destroy everything would be suggesting that God's going to destroy God's self because of sin. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Now, there's this incredible woman <clears throat> who goes by the name of Elia DeLeo, 
She has her doctorate in pharmacology, specializing in neurotoxicity. She has a second doctorate in his, uh, historical theology. So she's got a pretty good handle on both science and God. Incredible woman. She has this to say, and this fits into our discussion, I think, really well. Okay, she says this. Is it on the screen? There we go. Look, I'm glad you get to see this, because this is so good. The conventional visualization of the physical world was changed by Einstein's special theory of relativity, which showed that matter itself was a form of energy. For all practical purposes, energy is the real world. There it is, science revealing that everything is both matter and energy slash spirit co-inhering as one. This is a Christocentric world. This realization changes everything. Matter has become a holy thing, and the material world is the place where we can comfortably worship God just by walking on matter, by loving it, by respecting it. The Christ is God's active power inside of the physical world. I want to read that again, just because it's so good. So can we rewind? The conventional visualization of the physical world was changed by Einstein's special theory of relativity, which showed that matter itself was a form of energy. For all practical purposes, energy is the real world. There it is, science revealing that everything is both matter and energy slash spirit co-inhering as one. This is a Christocentric world. This realization changes everything. Matter has become a holy thing, and the material world is the place where we can comfortably worship God just by walking on matter, by loving it, by respecting it. The Christ is God's active power inside of the physical world. You see, when we understand Christ is not just limited to Jesus, like the ocean is not limited to the bucket. When you understand that Christ is over all and through all and in all and Christ is all and is in all, then even this is not just dirt. This is matter and energy. This is matter and spirit co-inhering. Co-inhering, by the way, means to exist together as one substance, which as Miss Delio says, matter has become a holy thing. Matter is revealing to us that which is already holy. And the material world is in fact a place where we can comfortably worship God just by walking on matter, by loving it, by respecting it. It's all sacred space. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but the scripture talks about how humanity was formed from the dust of the earth. So if this is already sacred, then what does that say about us who the scripture says we were created from it? It's already sacred. Do you see how much of a difference this makes in our foundational understanding of ourselves? Do you see how much of a difference this makes in understanding like all of the scriptures? How much would your perspective on everything change if our understanding was not one of original sin, but rather original sacredness, that you were not inherently bad, but that you are inherently sacred. So when we talk about Jesus Christ, or Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Son of God, the Word made flesh, the Christ made flesh, Jesus is the union of humanity and the divine in time and space. Christ is the eternal union of matter and spirit from the very beginning of time. Jesus is the presence of God in a way that we can understand. I understand this. I can get that. I can wrap my brain around that. That makes sense to me. That's comfortable. The formless took form in someone that we could see, hear, touch, so that we could more easily love and know God. First John, John talks about this. That which was from the beginning, 
which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. That which was at the beginning, we've seen it, we've touched it, we've felt it. Jesus is the concrete reality of the Christ who has always been, so that we can know and love God. Jesus is the map for us to know how to live and to navigate in this life in the here and now. And Christ is like the blueprint for all of time and space and life itself. <clears throat> Again, if you've never thought through this stuff before, like I imagine your brain might be buffering a little. It's okay. It's okay. It's a safe space here. It's not something to be afraid of. It's actually something to be quite excited about because this is a game changer for our perspective on most things, for who we are, for who God is, for the purpose of Jesus, how we understand these things. And I don't know about you, but I'd, rather, I'd much rather experience the beauty and the fullness of like the ocean <clears throat> rather than limit my understanding of the ocean to the bucket. Yeah, there's something beautiful there, isn't it? Now I'm grateful for this. There's a whole other thing out there. Now, now that we've got that all properly sorted, and I'm sure you have no questions, let's talk about bread. Let's talk about bread for a second. So last week, Joe talked about how Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So today, I want to look at another I am statement from Jesus, okay? From Jesus the Christ. John chapter 6, Jesus has just fed the 5,000. He's just walked on water. It's been a pretty busy day. He's got people follow him all around, ask him all these questions about what do we have to do in order to serve the Lord. They start asking Jesus, can you give us a sign because God gave our ancestors a sign when he sent the manna from heaven and that's how they knew. And so that's where we're at, picking up in verse 32, John chapter six, verse 32. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. If you skip down to verse 51 in the same chapter, it says this. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is, bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So I want to look at this idea from a couple different layers and perspectives. Okay, the first is this, just the most basic level. When we talk about bread, <clears throat> we're talking about this very simple food that is a staple for many people, right? It really just has five key ingredients. It's a simple food that would be a primary food source for these people at this time. They weren't avoiding bread because of carbs or gluten or anything. They were just happy to have something to eat. It was essential to their survival. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he's connecting these ideas of the physicality and spirituality. <clears throat> That just as the bread is essential to their body, Jesus is essential to providing life to their life, is essential to their soul. Now, when it comes to the bread itself, most of us love a good bread, don't we? Yeah. Endless breadsticks at Olive Garden, am I right? You go to a restaurant, you get some bread, we use it on sandwiches and toast, we dip it in soups, there's all kinds of wonderful things that we can do with the bread. Don't we love the smell of fresh bread? How many of you picked up on it? You smelled it as you came in. Yeah, I think this one. Oh, it's this one. We've got two loaves. You can smell that bread. I love going to the Publix bakery, just walking through. I don't ever buy anything, but I just like to walk through and enjoy the smell. <clears throat> There's something, this aroma that just kind of draws us in. There's something about the smell of bread that brings us like, we, and what is it that we're usually doing when we're having bread? We're, we're having a meal, 
We're sharing that bread with others. We're having a conversation. There, there seems to be this like very relational core to bread, to everything it is, to the ingredients, to how we use it, to how we share it. It seems to be very relational. <clears throat> I find it interesting that this aroma that we are drawn to, then once we have that bread, we take that and like then we pass that along. It's like we draw others into the thing that we were just drawn into. And I find it interesting that Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Like there's this aroma to who he is that draws us to it. And then once we get that, our response should be to, of course, yeah, we want to bring more people into that, don't we? And then not only that, but if you think about just the ingredients, right, we're not talking about like store-bought bread here with all the chemicals and the additives. We're talking about like fresh homemade bread. It's got five ingredients. It's got wheat, it's got <clears throat> honey or sugar, it's got salt, it's got yeast, it's got water. That's, that's it. When you look at these five main ingredients, they're all things that are like a part of the earth. Wheat itself is a grass, which means it's growing out of the soil of the earth. Sugar from the sugar cane is also a grass that grows out from the soil of the earth. You have salt, which is this natural mineral of the earth. You have yeast that is this living organism. It's technically classified as a fungus. I don't know if you know that. We're eating baked fungus. <laughs> That's how you get off a bread habit, by the way. If you're looking to lose weight or give up bread. It's a fungus. It grows in the wild. It helps with decomposing and dying and dead things so that those things and those nutrients can actually return back to the earth. And then, of course, you have water, which is essential to all of life on the earth. Bread <clears throat> is very much connected to the physicality of the earth, which is also the same thing that we happen to be made up of <laughs> that we then take into our bodies as well. There's this very deep relational connection between us and these ingredients and the bread that we use for sustenance. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Now let's think through this through the larger lens of the Christ, the Christ that is all and in all, the Christ that is before and after Jesus. In verse 51, Jesus says, I am the living bread. Now to me, when I hear this, I get like these heavy Christ vibes here. Here's what I mean. I was talking with this fine young gentleman this, this week about this. He's recently gotten into baking his own bread, which I think is really, really cool. And so I was asking him like what he appreciates about the process, what he's learned about the process. Um, and I, I obviously know nothing about bread other than I like it. So it was cool to hear like his stories and, and what he's learning along the way. <clears throat> But what I found, found so very interesting that he was explaining to me that he was also intrigued by was just uh, the process of like the sourdough bread stuff. I don't know, I know some people do this sort of thing, I don't, but essentially when it comes to sourdough bread, you're taking this thing that is alive and active and moving and growing. And so essentially what you're trying to do is to grow this bacteria that you then later eat. So you like take it and you like feed it sugar and water and then it grows and it expands. And it expands to the point that you have to take half of the, the dough out of the tray and set it aside. And then you keep feeding it and then it grows and it expands and you have to take half of that out again. And then you, keep, you just keep going through this process over and over. It just continues to grow and expand if you do it correctly. If you feed it properly, if you handle it correctly, it keeps growing and expanding. But if not, then that, those microorganisms will die and ruin the bread, will ruin the dough, right? It's just, there's like this whole active life process to this thing. It, it's, it's growing, it's expansive, it's benevolent. This whole thing keeps giving and giving and giving. And even the half that you take out as you're working on it, it's, it's like this waste part, but it's not actually waste. They call it the discard, but it's not actually waste. 
<clears throat> it's the extra that you don't need, but you can actually use that to make other things. So even in what you're taking out, there's an abundance to that. And not only that, but when he was telling me about the, the sourdough starter, which is the heart of the sourdough bread making process, that once you get it, once you get a starter with proper care, that thing can like, it's basically eternal. <laughs> like it can be separated <clears throat> and divided and passed along and shared to other people like almost infinitely. Like once you get it going, it just continues to give and to, to, to expand and to be generous. It can be divided and shared over and over and over and over and over and over. And it's fascinating to me that there's this perpetual abundance and generosity to the whole thing. And Jesus says, I am the living bread. <clears throat> Is it possible that he's speaking to this larger understanding of the Christ? The Christ that is all, that is over all, in all, and through all. It's a bit like Christ is the active ingredient of the universe. And people at this time would have been familiar with like sourdough bread making process. In fact, Jesus uses an illustration about it to describe the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. This was a part of the, of the illustration about what the kingdom of like, the kingdom of God is like, that it's growing and expanding and growing and expanding. So I really love this idea when Jesus says, I am the living bread. This idea of the Christ, this active ingredient within the universe. Because again, what it does is it moves us away from this like dualistic thinking of there's the physical and there's the spiritual. It separates us from seeing uh, and compartmentalizing the world into sacred and non-sacred places. It separates us from this idea of thinking that we could ever be separate from God. If something is a part of creation, it is a sacred space. Which reminds me of what Miss DeLeo said, matter has become a holy thing, and the material world is a place where we can comfortably worship God just by walking on matter, by loving it, by respecting it. The Christ is God's active power inside of the physical world. Jesus says, I am the living bread. Jesus, the Christ, is God's active power inside the physical world. All of the material world is a sacred space from the very far reaches of the universe to the very inmost parts of our being. So the very bread that we use to sustain our bodies from all the way out there to in here to this that we take in, it's all sacred. And when we understand that it's all sacred, this should radically change our approach to most things. When we're talking about the different people in our life, when we talk about the people that we can't stand, the people that are struggling, people that are sick in need, people that are dying, Jesus says, I am the living bread, which is God's active power inside the physical world which means that the Christ is in you, which means that the Christ is in them, which means the Christ is in me, which means we become the bread for one another, this relational thing that helps to build and support. What about when it comes to how we care for like the environment or maybe how we neglect the environment? This is a sacred space that we're living in. Did you know that the Seminole County dump in Geneva is one of like the top three or five highest mountains in Florida? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it makes me think like we haven't really taken this Christ in all very seriously. Like what altar are we worshiping at? Because what it looks like is we're worshiping at the altar of consumerism and convenience. And we've desecrated the sacred space of the earth that we were instructed to care for. What about the sacred space of the self? 
how do you think of the self? Do you live with this like continual less than mentality? Do you only see the flaws in yourself or in others? Are we taking care of the physical self? Are we doing the hard work of growing and protecting and working on the emotional, spiritual, and relational self? Or are we letting this bread go a bit stale? You ever had stale bread, by the way? And it's so disappointing. You're so sad. It's so gross. Like, why would I? Why I wouldn't want to eat that. <clears throat> Why would I want to offer that to others? Well, you wouldn't. You'd, you wouldn't do that, would you? But fresh, warm bread. Oh, that's, that's good. Living bread is healthy. There is life. It contributes to life, to our meals, to our bodies, to our tables, to our conversations, and our shared connections and relationships. Living bread is assisting and sustaining and celebrating life. Jesus Christ says, I am the living bread. Yeah, that's a beautiful invitation. It's an invitation to participate in this active, life-giving presence of God that we are saturated in. It's this invitation to experience the life that is continually growing and expanding. It's this invitation to the continual abundance of God, which we will never grow hungry. You know, I think it's fascinating, really. Let's make sure we don't burn our hands here. Whoa. Are you guys getting whiffs of this? You know what's really interesting to me, too, is if you struggle with the concept or idea of this Christ, okay, we see Jesus, we see Jesus, we get it. The Christ, how do we even understand that? Well, obviously, you know the bread is right here, so doesn't work that great. But how do you know where that smell is coming from if you don't see this? Right? How do you describe that smell? How do you how do you you smell it? How do you describe the Christ? That it's, it's, it's here, it's around, it's in, it's all through, it's all. It's like describing this aroma. Yeah. It permeates things, it draws people into it. It makes me come to it, but it also makes me want to share it. And when I experience it, I want to take it, I want to share it with others. And guess what? This bread with the right sourdough starter, you could keep making infinite bread. Like, what a beautiful thing. Why would I ever want to limit the Christ just to one little time period? And that's not to minimize Jesus. We're not minimizing Jesus. I want us to expand our understanding of who Christ is. And I think... I think if we can understand like this idea of the living bread um, and this idea of sacredness, I actually think it will help us to understand this idea of this fusing of Christ into all things, that all things have become sacred. All, all of it's a sacred space. God has created this God has created us out of this. God has infused God's self into this. The things that we eat come out of this. Do you see? It's all, it's all connected. There's nowhere that the Christ isn't. And if we can start to understand that, <clears throat> I think it might actually help us to understand that, yes, we love Jesus. We are grateful for Jesus. But the Christ was before and after Jesus. And if we understand the vastness of Christ, like the vastness of the ocean, Man, the point of Jesus is to help us to know that. The point of Jesus is to give us this tangible thing that we can know and see and touch and feel so that we can love God better. So if I can love Jesus this way and expand my understanding to this eternal Christ, this infinite Christ, oh, what a deeper, more profound experience. I want to go play in the ocean. I want to feel the waves. I want to feel the currents, I want to feel the coldness, I want to see the animals. Like, how cool is that? Yeah, and, and what's even cooler, I think, about all this is that this idea and this imagery of the bread and this Christ is so valued and important to Jesus that it becomes one of our most sacred practices, doesn't it? 
Luke 22 says this, and he took bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this and oh, it smells so good. Sorry. <laughs> it's really good job, Patty, on the bread. Let me just take a moment. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. So Jesus the Christ, who says, I am the living bread, in one of his last moments with all of his disciples, took the bread, broke it, and shared it. He says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, what is it that we're supposed to be remembering? Well, obviously the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I understand that. But maybe along with this, it's an invitation to remember the living bread. The living bread, the Christ that permeates all things. Maybe it's an invitation to remember that through Christ, all that is, is sacred. To remember that even when you feel down and alone or abandoned or hurt or like a piece of garbage, to remember that the Christ is all, the Christ is in all. There's nowhere that God isn't. Every cell, every atom, every quark, every far-reaching corner of every galaxy. God is there. Do this in remembrance of me. You see, again, when you understand this, Christ is the living bread, I think it helps us to understand this matter as a holy thing that the material world is in fact a sacred space. And if we can understand that, it might just help us to see Christ beyond the confines of the historical Jesus. That we can come to this place of knowing and experiencing the depth and beauty and power and vastness of the ocean. That we can know and experience more fully the depth and beauty and power and vastness of Christ for the sake of giving ourselves more fully into a loving relationship with God.